With the rise of the Galactic Empire, the Imperial Navy opted to rely upon the newly designed TIE Fighter as its starfighter of choice, rather than any of the numerous starfighters that had previously been used by the Republic. For an empire that relied primarily upon its Star Destroyer-sized capital ships to project its power and fulfill the desires of the Emperor, the TIE Fighter was the perfect starfighter to carry out the Imperial Navy's secondary strategic needs in support of the Star Destroyers. Although technologically superior in many regards to any other starfighter that existed at the time, the TIE Fighter was able to be mass-produced cheaply to reflect the Imperial philosophy of quantity over quality when it came to starfighters. Lacking deflector shields, a hyperdrive system, and only relying upon an armament comprising of two laser cannons, TIE Fighters certainly had a role to fulfill during the Imperial Era, but were ultimately viewed as an expendable Imperial asset. However, the expendability of the standard Imperial TIE Fighter came to be a weakness that was exploited by the Growing Rebellion and its fleet of far superior starfighters. In the year before the Battle of Yavin and the destruction of the Death Star, the Empire would learn the hard way that their TIE Fighters were not sufficient to meet the threat of the Rebels X-Wing and A-Wing starfighters. Recognizing that the Empire needed new fighters in the immediate years preceding the Galactic Civil War, Palpatine himself recognized that the Imperial Navy would need to entirely move away from its fleet of TIE Fighters and towards a newly designed superior starfighter model. In this video expose, I will explain Palpatine's plan that would have replaced every TIE Fighter with TIE Interceptors, and also describe why the Empire didn't upgrade to even more impressive models such as the TIE Avenger and the TIE Defender. For almost two decades, the TIE Fighter was more than capable of meeting the needs of the Imperial Navy. Because Imperial Naval Doctrine was heavily influenced by the Clone Wars, wherein the Empire sought to maximize capital ship firepower rather than achieve victory through starfighter superiority, starfighters were relegated behind the Star Destroyers that formed the backbone of the Imperial Fleet. The TIE Fighter fit the role as a complementary starfighter to the Imperial Star Destroyers perfectly. The standard TIE was a bare-bones starfighter where hyperdrives, deflector shields, and life support systems were removed and sacrificed to the greater demands of the Imperial Navy. But again, it was believed that the TIE Fighter did not need those systems given that they could still serve their complementary role as escorts, scouts, and ground troop support without them. This isn't to say that TIE Fighters were worthless either. Despite their lack of these more advanced systems, which did limit the survivability of the craft and pilot and the range of the fighter, the standard TIE was able to be designed to achieve great speed and maneuverability. In fact, when the TIE Fighter was introduced at the same time the Empire was formed, it had the most precisely manufactured propulsion system in the history of the galaxy, wherein it was extremely efficient and lightweight. Because they were stripped of all non-essential components and they performed with such efficiency, TIE Fighters could be mass-produced cheaply, allowing Imperial resources to be directed to more important areas. However, although the standard TIE Fighter adequately fulfilled its role within the Imperial Navy for roughly 18 years without a second thought, the tide started to change once the Rebel Alliance introduced the T-65 X-Wing and RZ-1 A-Wing into their efforts against the Empire. While the writing was on the wall when the Rebellion introduced the X-Wing into combat for the first time against the Imperial Navy at the Battle of Turkana, one year before the Battle of Yavin, where the X-Wings performed very well against their TIE Fighter foes, the true demonstration of the unworthiness of the standard TIE in the new emerging conflict against the rebels occurred within the Fi Hu campaign. Again, still one year before the Battle of Yavin, the Fi Hu campaign directly pitted the rebellion's T-65 X-Wings against the Empire's standard TIE fighters. Over the course of the campaign, the X-Wings completely decimated the vastly inferior TIEs, wherein a total of 286 Imperial TIE fighters were destroyed in nine months of fighting while only four X-Wings were destroyed over the same period. What was evident at Turkana was now undeniable. The TIE Fighter was no match against the Rebel X-Wing, 
and this mismatch was available to be exploited by the rebellion. Following the Fi Hu campaign, and particularly after the rebel victory at the Battle of Yavin, the Empire, along with Emperor Palpatine himself, decided on a new course in regard to the Imperial Navy's starfighters. Despite the fact that they were focused primarily on emphasizing the might of their Star Destroyer capital ships, the Empire set out on a bold new initiative that would see every standard TIE fighter replaced with the TIE Interceptor. In truth, the Interceptor wasn't that different from the TIE fighter in regard to its specifications and abilities. Just like its predecessor, the Interceptor lacked a hyperdrive, deflector shields, and life support systems. So if the TIE Interceptor lacked these critical, more advanced systems, why did the Empire plan to replace every TIE Fighter with this model? The primary advantages of the TIE Interceptor over its predecessor was that it offered a greater top speed of 1250 km per hour, which was far faster than the Rebel X-Wing of 1050 km per hour, and only slightly slower than the A-Wing's 1300. And even more importantly, the Interceptor offered far superior maneuverability. The increased speed and maneuverability, in combination with an increased armament of four laser cannons instead of two, and which were far more destructive, the Empire had a starfighter that could live up to its name, one that could intercept incoming Rebellion starfighters and take them out. This is why advanced systems like deflector shields and the hyperdrive were not added to the interceptor, as these features would have only made the starfighter more costly and therefore more difficult to mass produce, as well as heavier, thereby hindering the speed and maneuverability of the interceptor. More important for the Empire was the ability for the interceptor to overwhelm the rebellion starfighters with speed and numbers, and that's it. The Empire was not about to change course and overhaul its entire naval doctrine to try to incorporate a fighter that had shields, a hyperdrive, or heavier weapons such as a warhead launcher. The replacement for the TIE Fighter was always going to remain attached and a complement to the Imperial Navy's Star Destroyers, and thus they didn't need these systems. What the Empire would benefit from most was a faster starfighter with better maneuverability that could compete with the X-Wing and A-Wing. This is the primary reason why far superior starfighters like the TIE Defender, TIE Avenger, and TIE Advanced were not chosen by Palpatine and the Empire to replace the TIE Fighter. First, starting with the TIE Defender, it was far too costly given its hyperdrive, deflector shields, reinforced armor, and warhead launcher to be mass-produced and perform the necessary complementary role together with the Star Destroyers. Therefore, the TIE Defender only saw limited use, and was assigned solely to the Empire's most elite pilots. However, another prototype that was in competition with the TIE Interceptor to be the replacement for the standard TIE Fighter model was the TIE Advanced, codenamed TIE Advanced X-1. This was the model piloted by Darth Vader in A New Hope, and while it never made it into full-time production to replace the TIE Fighter, many of the best design features of the Advanced were incorporated into the Interceptor. But the Advanced simply didn't provide the Empire with the adequate countermeasure it needed in regard to the Rebellion's X-Wings and A-Wings. It was only slightly faster than the TIE Fighter by the smallest of margins, with no benefits to maneuverability due to the inclusion of experimental and inefficient deflector shields, heavier armor, and a hyperdrive. These advanced systems created an impressive starfighter, yes, but not one that the Empire could immediately benefit from in challenging the Rebellion's fighters, and was far too costly to be put into mass production for the Imperial Navy. There was one final prototype that challenged the TIE Interceptor as a viable replacement for the TIE Fighter, which was the TIE Avenger, codenamed TIE Advanced X-2. The Avenger suffered from many of the same deficiencies in the eyes of the Empire as the Advanced. Although the heavier armor incorporated into the Advanced was removed, the Avenger retained the hyperdrive system and deflector shields, but also added a warhead launcher for greater offensive capabilities. Again, like the Defender and Advanced, the Avenger was an impressive starfighter, 
but it wasn't capable of meeting the demands of the Imperial Navy within the parameters of its current structure and doctrine. While the Avenger also suffered from the fact that it was too costly to be mass-produced, those within the Imperial Naval hierarchy feared that adopting starfighters specifically like the Avenger would reduce the Imperial fleet to a composition of carriers and swarms of fighters, thereby revisiting the failed and outdated tactics of the previous Clone War era. Due to the fact that the Avenger would not operate as a complement to the already Star Destroyer-specific fleet, and was not cost-effective, it too was passed over in the efforts to find a replacement for the TIE Fighter. Therefore, it was the third prototype, the TIE Advanced X-3, or TIE Interceptor, that provided the Imperial Navy with the perfect response to the threat caused by the superior starfighters of the Rebellion. The Interceptor was cheap enough to be mass-produced, it offered superior speed and maneuverability, to intercept and challenge Rebel X-Wings and A-Wings, and perhaps most importantly, it could fulfill the secondary and complementary roles that starfighters were expected to perform within the greater Imperial Naval Doctrine, whereby star destroyers continued to be the backbone of the Imperial fleet. Ultimately, TIE Interceptors would come to represent 20% of the entire Imperial Starfighter Corps by the time of the Battle of Yavin and had the Emperor and the Empire had the opportunity to see their plans through, the Interceptor would have come to replace every Imperial TIE Fighter. So there we have it, Palpatine's plan to replace every TIE Fighter with TIE Interceptors. We love making these videos, so why not subscribe for more fun Star Wars theories and discussions? Also, if you enjoyed the video, think about giving a like or leaving a comment. If not for me... For Thai Prototype!